Hey, Dee, would you uh, open us in prayer today? Father, we are so thankful for you and for the lengths that you have gone to make a way for us to have relationship with you. We ask that you give Joel a real anointing and an ability to communicate the things in his heart. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would take those things to the other hearts and the right people and that they should go from shore to shore like waves. And that you would do what you want to do with this, Father. That our small efforts would produce results for the kingdom. For that's why we live and breathe. For relationship with you is the only reason we have for doing anything. We thank you, Lord, and we offer this time to you in Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So, a few of you were here last week. I'd like to, before we talk about repentance, does anybody remember what grounds and conditions are? Y'all missed that, so you may not know the difference. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But I felt like that was a very important distinction to make when discussing these ideas. Um, Brian. Do you remember the difference between? I, I, I still need to wrap my head around it. That, <laughs> it's okay. It's, uh, some of these concepts, <clears throat> mm -hmm. my mind can't wrap around it. So that's I'm all right. Sorry, but I, that's I, that's I, okay. But I see you're, you're on the spot because you're like the only guy here today. So. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a, an answer? Brian? How about Brian? Um, so there are a few new people sitting over here. So I, last week we talked about the difference between grounds and conditions before we ever talked about faith and why faith is a condition for salvation. And the important distinction to make is that the ground of salvation is God's love, but a condition is something that salvation cannot happen without. It's a not without which. It does not produce salvation. It does not make God love you. But God can't be reconciled and you can't be reconciled to God without faith was what we talked about last week. That's one of the conditions of salvation. Another condition of salvation, and something else I pointed out is that when people say you have to do something to be saved, some people get really worked up over that. Yeah. But you do have to have faith to be saved. And as we read in Ephesians, it is by uh, God's grace through your faith that you're saved. It's not just by God's grace. Your faith has something to do with that. You have to trust God to be saved. And the Bible is very clear on that. But a condition is not the same thing as a work. A work is something that earns you something. Uh, a work is something that you perform uh, a deed or something and you earn a wage or you earn what is just or what is entitled to you. But a condition is not that. A condition, a condition is just something you have to do uh, or else uh, God's love cannot have its effect. So I've been comparing this idea of reconciliation with God to being like a road. And the road exists, and it's there whether there's roadblocks set up or not. If there's a landslide of rocks and there's boulders across the highway, the road is there. The path from one destination to another is there. But without those roadblocks removed, you cannot get from one point to another. And unless certain roadblocks are removed in man and certain roadblocks are removed as far as God's responsibilities go, reconciliation cannot take place without those things being removed. So faith, we talked about last week, is one of the conditions of salvation, and that removes a great many roadblocks concerning man in restoring man to trust. But this week, I want to cover the idea of repentance. And I'm, num I'm enumerating these, or numbering these, uh, as condition one, condition two, and then the next two weeks we'll talk about atonement, and that'll be condition three. And that's just for simplicity, so you can keep them in your mind. I'm not saying this is the totality of everything that goes into being saved, but I think, in my mind, those are the three main conditions as I understand them. So, when it comes to repentance, Faith, repentance and atonement, and we'll talk about atonement the last two weeks, which will be next week and the week after. So, 
Hey guys, glad you're here. Um, so repentance is a condition for salvation. That right there would get me thrown out of some churches, <laughs> what I just said. Um, at, at least in my experience, that's been, oh, yeah. it's contentious, is it not? <clears throat> but I'm going to show you that repentance is something necessary for salvation. It does not earn you anything. It is not the grounds of your salvation, but it is part of being made right with God. And I'm going to show you throughout the New Testament how this actually applies to everybody. It applies to Jews. It applies to Gentiles. Is anybody in here a Jew? I think we're all Gentiles. We're all non-Jews, probably. Um, it applies to everybody. And we're going to talk about what repentance is. So I'm not going to make a case for which comes first, faith or repentance. When it comes to having a new heart with God, repentance and faith are both part of it. They're two sides of the same coin. You don't have faith without repentance, and you don't have real repentance without faith. I'm going to just leave that explanation at that. I don't get too hung up in the order of, uh, of which one comes first, faith or repentance. So, chicken or the egg, it's both. You've got to have both. And I don't, I, don't know about, I don't know if the order really matters that much. So, what is repentance? The definition in the Bible is a word called metanoia. I'm not putting it up there because it doesn't really matter to you. But it might, probably doesn't matter to you. The point is the meaning of the word. The meaning of the word really just means a change of mind. So when it comes to sin and the sinner, repentance is a change in attitude and willingness towards sin and towards God. It's not just strictly a turning from sin or a ceasing from a certain type of activity. It always implies a turn of the mind resulting in a change of activity towards God. It's not just, I'm not going to smoke anymore, or I'm not going to do whatever the thing you feel convicted about is. It's, I'm going to turn my whole mind and life towards God. And that's the way the Bible describes it. It's a turning from sin towards God. I'll also say this. There is an initial repentance in any salvation, in any person being reconciled to God. There's an initial point of repentance. But there's also a state of continual repentance. Uh, we'll review in a minute. Paul talks about renewing of your mind. John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And then Paul later on basically quotes that same idea by John the Baptist in his ministry, saying there's bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. So it's a continual state of mind where you're being renewed. And as you learn, you obey what you learn. Repentance and what it is not. I'll say this. Repentance, I'm going to quote Charles Finney here. Repentance is not just a sense of remorse, or else hell is full of repentance. Would that not be true? Some people think repentance is, I feel really bad about my sin. I just feel so guilty, and that's a sign that I'm repentant. Well, feeling guilty and feeling remorse is part of repentance. I think you don't have true repentance without that. But it's not strictly a feeling. So Jesus preached repentance. Shocking, right? In fact, after he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness, by the devil and fasted 40 days. It says in the book of Matthew 4.17, Jesus went therefore and preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus started his ministry, that was literally the first word in the book of Matthew. It's his first message. That was the core of his message, the author's summing up. Repent. It's the first word. Another instance of Jesus preaching repentance. He said things like this, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Luke 13, verses 1 through 5, it says, On the same occasion there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. It's pretty gross, right? Because some Galileans got in trouble, Pilate had them killed and mixed it with their sacrifices to really defile the activity of the Jews. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that those Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? He doesn't really answer it so directly, but he draws a spiritual parallel and says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Did he mean you're going to die exactly the same way as those guys? I don't, I don't think so, but he means if you don't repent, you're going to suffer death. You're going to suffer perishing. We talked about what spiritual death is, I think, in the, the first couple sessions of this. He goes on to say, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
So you will likewise perish unless you do what? Repent. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's, it's right there. It's uh, one of those conditional statements. Unless this, this will occur. If this, then this. And we covered that last week. If you guys want to listen to that so you understand what an if-then statement is. Yeah, I I'm just being know. funny. I think y'all might. <laughs> anyway. Um, Peter, he preached repentance. This Jewish guy preached repentance to the Jews. It's right here in Acts 2. The Jews were listening to him on Pentecost. When he preached at Pentecost, it says, Now when the Jews heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Nothing! Salvation is of the Lord! <laughs> is that what he said? No, no I'm being funny. He said, Repent! And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He then went on a little bit later and he said, Save yourself from this wicked generation. So that's the language Peter used. Here in the next chapter, after Jesus, or after Peter and John heal, well, it would be Jesus who healed the paralytic, but Peter and John were used to heal the paralytic. And uh, after they heal the paralyzed man, it gathers a crowd. People come and watch and listen. And Peter preaches his second sermon. He says, Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. A few verses later, he says, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. Isn't that cool? God sent Jesus so that. Right, there's the so that. There's the that's conditional true. statement in there. Yeah. But I think that's so cool. Peter said that it was a blessing. God sent Jesus to bless mankind by turning us from our wicked ways. It's a blessing to turn from sin. Uh, repentance is not a burden. It's returning your mind and your way of thinking to God's way of thinking about sin. Paul preached repentance. In Acts 26, he's speaking to King Agrippa and he's reviewing the uh, circumstances of his own conversion, of Paul's conversion. And he tells Agrippa about what happened and how Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he says that this was the message that, he's telling Agrippa the message that Jesus gave to Paul. He said, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So he's telling Agrippa about his ministry to the Gentiles. And I think that's so, so neat. It says it's a turning, you know, the word repentance is not necessarily in here, but it's a turning. That's repentance. It's the change of mind or the turning of mind that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. There's the dominion, the dome, the dome idea. The dominion of Satan to God. And in that, they receive forgiveness of sins. And I love that he points out that they are sanctified by faith, which we talked about last week. That's one of the results of faith, is that it sanctifies you, it purifies you, it makes you holy. He continues later, Paul says, So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. So we can see that repentance is for all people. Uh, there are, are some ideas in the church that repentance is only for a certain kind of people at a certain point in time. Uh, well, that was only for the Jews or it was only before the cross or uh, it doesn't have any place today in this dispensation or whatever might be the language you hear. And I just don't see that in the Bible when I read it. Um, I mean, I'm always open to correction. But when I read the Bible, it seems like Paul, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, still preached repentance as something being necessary to receive forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist preached repentance. I know he preached it before these other guys I spoke of, but... I'm going to bring him in because he's, he's not as important, I think, as Jesus himself. But 
When, many, when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So John the Baptist preached a message that repentance was necessary to be right and to be prepared for the work that Jesus was coming to demonstrate uh, before man. And I would, I would say this, I didn't write this down, but if you want to read a, an interesting cross-reference of this idea, John the Baptist says, every tree that, is not, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Read John chapter 15, Jesus' own words about how he is the vine and we are the branches and we are to abide in him. It's the same language, it's that same idea in John 15, if you'd like to read something where Jesus shares the same theme. Well, and when you said, when you said it was uh, people who think if you do anything, it's work, but mm. that right there just said, bear fruit. That's, that, that means there's something there. You <clears throat> yeah, that's right. A tree doesn't work to bear fruit, right? No. If it's a good tree, it bears a certain type of fruit. It will, it will grow out of the tree, and if a person whose heart is right with God, they will bear... I'm sorry, what? It's a product of health. It's a product of health, yes. So you'll... But if there's no fruit or there's bad fruit, it's unhealthy. Then that's a sign that it's a bad tree, yeah. if there's no fruit or, or, or bad fruit, right. And I think we have, when he called them brood of vipers, I think he was speaking to this, this thing that the Holy Spirit knew, that John knew by the Holy Spirit, that they were disingenuous. Mm. That, they, that they were one thing on the outside, and another thing on the inside, and Jesus spent a lot of time addressing that very fact. So when John said, bear fruit, in other words, he said, you come in here asking me to baptize you, saying I repent. He said, well, then actually you have to do, that is going to show up in the way the changes that God will see. Maybe no one else will see them, but God will see these changes in your mm -hmm. heart and your life and the way you act. And, you know, that's why he was addressing that specifically to the Pharisees, because that was their deal. That was their mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's kind of calling into question their motivation for being there. He's saying, you guys are here. What are you really here for? You're really here just to see what's going on so you can, you know, approve or disapprove of John's baptism, or are you really here to get right with God? Yeah. Oh, Rodney, you had something. This is a good place, John the Baptist and the Pharisees, to bring out the fact that when you're dealing with religious people, especially, you can have a motive for repenting that is impure. You can want to change your ways to simply stop being having the consequences that you have. Like there's many a guy who says, "Oh, I'm going to stop drinking because you know the wife and kids really give me a hard time about it, and it's probably right that I should." Mm -hmm. Their motive isn't to please God. Their motive isn't to really clean up their life. It's like a dog returning to its vomit. Mm -hmm. You know, once the pain has gone away, oh, oh boy, here we go. And no, so that's, that's true. Religious people, especially, or people who have a religious background, well, the self help, the 12 step programs mm -hmm. deal with that. Yeah, that kind of yeah, a false repentance. And I've I've got a whole I've got two really fun lists here at the end of true and false repentance. And that's one of the things on there is a false repentance often exchanges one type of selfishness for another type of selfishness, but it doesn't deal with the selfishness in the heart. Right. right. That's very good. I have a question about that though, because I struggle with that. There are at the front, at the forefront of a decision. Sometimes somebody makes a decision. To come to the Lord on a basis of I don't want to go to hell, right. um, and in my mind where I'm at, what I've learned is I don't I don't see that to be a good motive to come to the Lord. But then I 
I know that a lot of the evangelism that happens, repent or you'll perish, is built on that fear. Um, and so you say, well, don't have fear. You need to come out of love for the Lord. That's the gospel. But you need to repent or perish. And so what? how do we, how do we make that um, parallel? How do we make that? Well, you need to come with right motives. You need to be praying that you're going to perish. Mm. And that's not a good motive. You don't want to. You don't want to perish, but that's not the motive for getting saved. So, what's the right motive? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always struggled with that because it seems like an incongruency of message. You, you're, you're coming with wrong motive to get to get saved, but then, you know, you, you understand my question. Yeah, I understand your question. Um, I, I, I would just say this: it's that's a little bit of a different subject, but that's a very good question. I think God uses whatever motivation we have to get His foot in the door, and sinners are going to come on selfish motives. And, uh, you know, for me, it was going to a youth group because the girl I liked invited me to youth group. That, that, was, that was it. I didn't have a good motive. It wasn't like, oh, I really, uh, I, I trust and love. Even though I'm a total sinner, I'm going to come to God on motive of love and trust. No, it was like, well, this is kind of interesting. I guess I'll see what it's all about. You know, um, God, uses, God uses sanctions of law and motivations of law and penalty to draw one's attention to their spiritual state. And as the idea of God's character is developed in the mind, specifically through his suffering and death and resurrection, you get to see the full picture of the character of God. And that breaks the sinner's heart down. So we're not talking about an event-driven repentance. We're talking about a life-driven repentance. Yeah, yeah. It's a, repentance is a... That's when you get to the true and false repentance. Is that today? You're going to do that? Yeah, I'd love to, love to if I can squeeze it in. Yeah, yeah so I, that's... I think that will cover I think that would help cover that. It will, but that's a great question. No, you don't live in that state of, I'm repenting or else I'm going to perish. Right. But, it's but it's, he's just, Jesus is just stating the fact. He's just stating facts. If you don't repent, you're going to perish. It's not, boy, if you don't do what I'm going to say, you're going to perish. Right. I'm going to whoop you good. He's just saying, this is the result of you not getting right with God. You're going to perish. But the purpose of that statement is to evoke the fear of the... Well, it certainly does. It certainly does that. Not necessarily. That may not necessarily be the motivation. Like, that's what he's saying. He's just stating the facts. It's, he's stating a fact of what we don't know his motivation. He's not saying that, therefore... You know what I mean? But, it, but the, even, even the selfish motivation gets that person looking to God. Whosoever calls upon the Lord in the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, God wants to bring that person to a state where they realize, I am lost right. unless I give my life to you completely. I don't have a problem. I'm, yeah. just, I'm just asking the question to beg the question. Mm -hmm. It seems as if, if we're saying that false repentance is built on a condition of fear or a bad motive, mm -hmm. then... I wanted to see the congruency of the mm -hmm. statement then. But the Bible, the Bible in multiple places says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And you don't come to appreciate and love and know God unless you first reverently respect and fear Him as God. Right. Uh, Jesus said, don't fear man who can only kill the body, but fear God who can cast body and spirit into hell. So there is a place to fear God. That is proper, and that is where our understanding of Him begins. Uh, a, small a small child learns to respect and fear the parent because they're going to be, you're going to get spanked when you're little. You, you know, you, you, train, you, 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 you train your child through types of physical consequence, and they learn the idea of this person's in charge, this punishment is to be feared, but you grow in a... In, in understanding their character, and you grow in a relationship beyond that point. Like with your own dad, when you were young, you talked many times about. I understand all that. I'm not yeah, saying. Yeah. I'm saying when we label the motivation mm -hmm. as whether it's counterfeit or not counterfeit, and the motivation is to stay away from that, like the punishment of that mm -hmm. or the consequence of that action. When I drink or when I get plastered or mm -hmm. when I smoke, I get lung cancer. Those things, yes, they're byproducts, but that emotional decision. As built on that fear, that premise, is that a bad motivation or is that a starting point? It's not a good motivation ever until your motivation is to love God completely with all your heart. Okay. But, but that, that, that selfish motivation gets you looking to the Lord for an answer to your moral problem, I would just say. And, and at the end, we're going to talk about what's the difference between good. true repentance and false repentance. Because I'd say if you live in that state, that's false repentance. Absolutely. That's you're doing it in love for the Lord after after He corrects you and you learn mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I understand the development of character. 
understand the onset, right? the mm -hmm. motivation. Um, but you're right, nobody in the beginning, they, they, everyone has a selfish motive, so they, mm -hmm. they, the, the yeah. search begins. Mm -hmm. yeah. so the, the search, search begins, is, that's a good way to yeah. put it, yeah. right. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but the goodness right. of right. God yes. leads, leads us to repentance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that there's always these two things at work, mm -hmm. and I think that's where the parable of the, the seed, parable of soils, mm -hmm. comes into play. This motive makes all the difference. Whether, whether we transition, whether the heart is able to be made pliable and soft, you know, and, and the gospel to take root. Anyway, that's, mm -hmm. the, both of those things have to be at work. Yeah, Rodney. There's foxhole conversions mm -hmm. for the beginning, but it has to go past that. Right. There, there's also a proverb that says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Mm -hmm. That's the balance there. You start out with a motive, hey, I better do something or no, I'm going to die deep trouble, but mm -hmm. it has to go past that. It has mm -hmm. to go into a knowledge of God and an understanding of what He's wanting and why. No, that's very good. And even with my own kids, um, especially with my oldest, he has, to a large extent, from my observation, moved beyond obeying out of fear and generally trusts what I tell him. Doesn't always like it, but he'll, okay, Daddy, I, I trust you, I, okay. Or he'll tell the younger ones, just believe what daddy says. Why don't you just do what he says? Like, I'll hear that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, you're such a good son. <laughs> and, then, and then I have younger children who they still, they do not respond out of just strictly love and trust. They need the penalty. They need the threat of a consequence to motivate their thinking because they just haven't moved into that level of trust with me. Um, so those are all really, really good comments you guys shared. Um, so I want to point out, God really loves repentance. It makes God happy. He's full of joy when somebody repents. This is something God is after. He wants people to repent of their sin. Uh, in Luke 15, 7 and 10, uh, there's two instances where this is shared. There's the man, the shepherd, uh, who finds the lost sheep. Jesus says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. In the case where the woman finds the lost coin in verse 10, he says, I... In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The prodigal son, one of the most powerful parables in the Bible, especially when it comes to this. Um, I'm not going to read the entire story because it's really long, but it's in Luke 15. And it says so many things about the, the heart of God towards the repentant sinner, and it says a lot about the heart of the repentant sinner. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 20. So, in reference to the son. So he got up and came to his father. And by the way, I do want to say this. Um, I don't believe this is in this section I'm reading, but when the son is there wanting to eat the pig food, it says, he came to his senses and realized, my father's servants have it better than this. That's part of repentance. I think it means he, he came to his mind. He, he came to clear thinking. He, he, his... Uh, he came to his senses, is the phrase we say. He started thinking clearly for the first time and realized, I should just go back to my father's house. And that's repentance. This is, the way I'm living is garbage. My heart is garbage. I need to go to God for help. That's the beginning of repentance. So, <clears throat> it says, while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father says, bring out the robe, bring out the cow, let's eat the cow and have a party. And then the father says this, this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Remember at the beginning we talked about the idea of salvation being something that was lost now being found. Here Jesus is saying, this is what it is to be lost. This is what it is to be found. The son was outside of the relationship and, and home and household and care of the father. Now he's back home again. That is what it means to be lost and to be found. What does it mean to be dead? Remember the word dead, Ephesians 2, very, a word with very many opinions about it. 
But Jesus said, this son of mine was dead. Was the son physically dead? No, he was out doing all kinds of stuff. The son who was dead came to his senses, changed his mind, and went back to the father. And the father says, the son has now come to life again. This is how Jesus is describing being dead, coming to life. This demonstrates the heart of the repentant sinner and the heart of God. Repentance also includes restitution. Real quickly, we talked about Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus said, if I've, if I've you know, stolen from anybody or taken more than I should have, I'll give it back four times as much. And then Jesus said, salvation has come to this household. So that's a big part of it. Setting things right when you can set them right. If it's within your power to make things right, go and do so. That's a proof of conversion. A proof of conversion, a fruit of repentance. Yeah, that would be that would be right. If I'm sorry. If your heart is aligned with God and you have truly turned, then that's something that you want to do yep. because you realize that you have wronged. You want that's that's why Jesus didn't have to convince Zacchaeus to do anything. It was a byproduct of that turning towards and aligning with the purpose of God. Yeah, you know, in that account, Jesus isn't like, well, Zacchaeus, you know, have you wronged anybody? Are you sure you shouldn't go do something about that? Hint, hint. You know, he didn't, I mean, we, it doesn't say that. It just says, and Zacchaeus said, and if I've wronged anybody, I'll make it right. Repentance also includes confession, confession of your sins. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, verse 10 says, if we confess our sins, it says if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, two there. yeah, right. So you have to confess and you can't be in a state of mind that says, I haven't really done anything wrong. I'm not really that bad, right? That's one of the trademarks of the mind of the sinner. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. Yeah, I've done some bad things, but I'm not really that bad. I'm not really, I'm not really sinned, like bad, bad. Jim, I'm, I'm <laughs> Jim really does set the standard for us all, doesn't he? We love you, Jim. Oh, you, you're, you're the punching bag in here so much, but you know what? You, you dish it out, so you have it coming. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. I've known Jim long enough. No, you're awesome, Jim. Um, yeah, so we confess our sins, then he is faithful and righteous. He's faithful to forgive us when we confess our sins. It means he will come through on forgiving your sins. He will do it. He said he would, and he will when you believe him. He's also righteous to forgive us our sins. God is in the right when he forgives our sins. It's not without a proper justification on his part. He's not forgiving people uh, uh, against the moral law. When a person has transgressed God's law, he is still in the right to forgive that person. And we'll, we'll see further that that is where the atonement really comes in. Jim? That scripture you read, though, there was, there was two ifs. And, and you don't have... And, <clears throat> and, 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 is one or the other. Either you do confess, Either you do or, you confess or you're saying you haven't sinned. You don't have a choice of whether or not you're going to do one or the other. Right. So you, you're, you're in that, what do they call it, the between the rock and the hard place? Between a rock and a hard place. Either you're going to confess or you're not. Mm -hmm. and, and what you do determines, your, mm -hmm. determines the outcome, right? That's right. All of these are pointing back to the character of God. It's not for his own sake, even though we do it for his sake. He's do, he, all of these things are in place to remove um, the consequence and the ramifications on kingdom of that sin. So if you are still in secret sin or you're still in denial of said sin, then it is still detrimental not only to you, your relationship with the Lord, but to the kingdom around you. You're still, mm -hmm. And so as God's calling him out of these things, it's not because he's beating his chest to say, I want you to admit that I'm God and you're not, although that's it's not an ego thing. It's a benevolent thing. It's all pointing back yeah. to the character of love from the Lord. No, that's right. I mean, God is all about the truth. And if you're a sinner, then the truth is you're a sinner. And the truth is there's a way to be made right with God. And you need to come to God on his terms. Um, yeah, it's not just because God wants to whip you into shape. It's because that really is what's best for the universe, is when people love God supremely and love their neighbor with the same motivation. So I've heard the argument that the Apostle John didn't teach repentance. 
I've heard this. But the word, the word repent, apparently, and repentance are not in any of John's writings. I mean, in the book of Revelation, Jesus tells the church to repent a whole bunch. I didn't even list that here. But, but, but John uses language like this, and this is just 1 John. We do see confession of sin, walking in the light, obeying God, abiding in God, practicing righteousness, passing out of death into life, not loving the world, and guarding yourself from idols. Now, maybe the word repentance isn't in there, but it sure sounds like the state of heart of a person who has repented. So I just want to point that out. It's just, it's just a silly little argument I've heard before. Okay? What did they, what did they mean by bringing that argument up? I don't know. Well, we'll I don't know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's one of those little things I've heard. It's a weird little thing about John. He doesn't harp on repentance a lot, but you hear repentance, repentance all throughout the other Gospels. Yeah. But John, whose Gospel is very different anyway, yes. uh, it's just not mentioned there. But we see the fruit and command towards these types of, uh, of attitudes that clearly are repentant. Anyways, that's a side note. Yeah, First John three for real. Um, so when you confess and you you confess to God your real moral state before Him, that is part of humility. And I define it like this: humility is the willingness to be known for one's true character. Humility is not to say I am lower than I am. Um, People will say pride is the opposite of humility. I would say to say that I am lower than I am or less than I actually am is actually a form of pride. It's just a reverse pride. Um, humility is bringing yourself to a neutral standing, not elevating yourself, not being lower than what you actually are. It's just to confess what you truly are. That's a state of humility, and God wants you to be humble. In fact, throughout Scripture, humility is a necessary characteristic to receive God's grace and truth. He says he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He doesn't say his grace makes you humble. He says he gives grace to the humble. Those who humble themselves receive God's favor, receive his attention, receive his work in their life. Now this doesn't contain the word repentance, but it illustrates that idea of keeping with repentance, I think. Paul says in Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So sorrow, regret, remorse about your sin, that is part of repentance, and that is definitely a felt part of the experience. But sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But sorrow of the world produces death. This is, you mentioned the verse. Um, did you mention this verse a minute ago? You mentioned maybe another verse I'm about to get to. Um, true sorrow that is grieved the way God's heart is grieved over sin produces true repentance without regret. Instead of saying, I've changed, you know, the, the false repentance would be, I've changed my ways, I'm trying to reform my life, and then a few weeks later or a few months later, your buddies want to take you out to do the same activities that you repented from, and you're thinking, man, I really miss doing that. Yeah. I kind of regret my repentance. Yeah. Not that you use that language, but it's like, I really miss doing those old things I did. Was this the right decision? That's false repentance. But true sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. You've thrown off the old way of living, the old way of thinking, and you continue on in that. Um, anyways, the sorrow of the world produces death, but the sorrow that leads to godly repentance produces salvation. So, let's talk about false repentance real quick. I think we can get through these before time. False repentance, I'm just summing these up in some points that I find uh, to be good definitions for myself. False repentance. Worldly sorrow. You'll have regret, but it'll be regret with regard to your worldly interests and motives. And if you want these notes after, you're welcome to come grab them from me. So, it's not having regret from God's perspective or regret concerning the things of God and what matters to God's heart. It's regret over your life and your circumstances. That's worldly sorrow. False repentance leaves the heart unsubdued 
towards God. It's partial surrender. Is partial surrender surrender? No, no it never is. Total surrender unconditional is surrender. unconditional surrender, yeah. right? To say, I'm in your hands. Yeah. No strings attached. That's full surrender. But false repentance is not full surrender. False repentance makes efforts to conceal the repentance and reality of their sin. Um, every new believer starts to face this, and um, this is an opportunity to either grow or to backslide. And it's when you have made a decision to follow Jesus, and now you're around those old friends or those family members who've seen you at your worst to know what you just were last week or the month before. And are you gonna kinda hide the change in your life? You've made decisions, I'm not gonna live this way, I'm not gonna look at this, I'm not gonna partake in these activities that God has convicted me of and shown me that these things are sin. Are you going to say, no, I don't live that way anymore. I follow Jesus, I was wrong. Or are you gonna say, well, you know, I'm figuring things out, or, or whatever. I don't mean to say a, a, a certain response is right or wrong, but is there a hesitancy that you act on, or do you, uh, are you quick to say that, you know, I follow Jesus now? And yes, that's the way I live, but I don't live that way anymore. You know, if people bring up things from my past, I want to say, I was wrong. I wasn't following God then. But, and I'm very sorry, and, and to my shame, it's true. But that's reality. But I don't live like that anymore. False repentance will have a lack of change in conduct. I think that's obvious. If you've not truly repented and you're still doing the same things that are clearly sin, I'm trying not to name specific sins here because when you get, start to get right with God, um, He starts to show you what is sin to you. That thing that really holds the affection of your heart. He starts to say, because I'm pointing with my finger, but it's like that. He like points his finger at that thing and says, hey, hey, what about that? What about that? I don't like that. I don't like that attitude. I don't like that thing. I don't, that offends me. That grieves me. That's not good for you. And if it's false repentance, one won't change in those ways. They still hang on to their old ways. Rodney? Something that probably should be brought out about repentance, and it's true of any moral quality, is that it's a choice. Repentance is something you choose. Mm. It's a choice you make. It's not a feeling. It's not circumstances but it's a choice to be different. It's a choice to change. And a lot of people don't make that clear. I've talked to people before and they say, well, if I live for Jesus, will I have to give up? It doesn't matter what they say, mm -hmm. will I have to give up? I tell them yes, because it's obviously more important to you. That's right. God and pleasing God. Mm -hmm. So there are choices in the repentance, and people need to know that. They need to count the cost. Yeah. No, that's very good. And I guess it doesn't go without saying that repentance is a choice. Um, my worldview holds that we have free will, and faith is a choice, repentance is a choice, believing, <clears throat> believing is a choice. Sin or righteousness is ultimately a choice. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, repentance is a choice. Uh, after all, it is a commandment. We are commanded to repent, and any commandment of God implies our ability to choose to obey or not. It goes without saying in my mind, but I'm glad you brought it up. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not just a state of your feelings. It's something we're actually commanded to choose and act upon. This is, I mentioned that before, a lack of change in conduct. Maybe a person will say, oh, I'm, I'm feeling convicted about the sin of drinking too much or something. You, you brought that up. And so maybe they do away with that, but sure enough, there's still other forms of selfishness. So other forms of, of, of uh, sinful indulgences or things, ways to still elevate self and please self supremely. And often one type of selfishness can just be replaced with another. That's a sign of false repentance. False repentance, it changes, the outward changes are motivated by a fear of punishment, not love and trust. If you're doing, if you're doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons, it's still sin. People can be outwardly good,
by all appearances, but they could be doing it from the wrong heart motivation. And if I'm just trying to be good so I don't go to hell, I'm doing it for the wrong reason. Now, again, we need to, because I think the, the attitude of repentance is based on a false construct of the church, which dumbs it down to an event-driven thing where mm -hmm. an evangelist calls you to an altar and you, you do the event of repentance and that's your duty, that's the thing that you do. So but if we get away from that construct and we base it on an alignment to what God wants in your life on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. then this makes sense. It, it, it doesn't cause the right. that I was talking about before. Because right. if it's just at the onset, you said, well, you can't, there's no other foundation to build on than selfish foundations. Right. If it's an event thing, mm -hmm then it's the foundation you're shoddy at, at the front. Yeah, it's one and done. Because you, you, you come to God, maybe you come to God just based on that fear, and then somebody says, oh, hey, uh, you repented, you had faith, yeah. you're in. But we often come to God, I mean, really, don't we all ultimately come to God based on some kind of fear of consequence? Um, I mean, Jesus preached about the sanctions of the law and the, and the punishment of sin. Uh, we all initially start to pay attention to God. He gets our attention that way. And, but you move beyond that. You move into a state of understanding God and, and it's the beginning, of, uh, the beginning of wisdom is fear, but knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Your mind and your relationship with God grow beyond that. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse. What I'm saying is that most individuals, when they look, and, and for the basis of this class, we're talking about community theology. Mm -hmm. Most individuals equate repentance as a choice that they made on a hell house or yeah possibly that, sure that's their definition mm -hmm. of repentance it's not what what you're referring to here on a day-to-day -day alignment with the purpose of god as he shows and you have seen that it's wrong that you are you're repentant of that sin it's a continual uh, choice to align yourself with the purposes and deny yourself um and most people don't they don't equate that to a repentance they mm -hmm. think that it's an event thing it's not a life thing Right, and I hope it's coming through that it's not just a one-time event thing. <clears throat> well, I, I think culturally yeah. we have to address the fact that this event is what is predominant in the minds of most religious people. That is what people think of mm -hmm. when you say the words, did he, she get saved? Right. And they don't use the word repent, and they, don't, they, they, they use religious language to wrap this idea of an event-driven salvation um, in terms that, sadly, I believe, are give them the ability to enumerate and point to a certain kind of success that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. right? Being converted when I was very young gave me a different perspective because I have walked with the Lord and I remember the event in my life. I remember being at a certain place and being invited to come and invite the Lord to be in charge of my life. And I remember doing that. I remember that point at which I chose to submit to the Lord. And I really believe that that event was valid in my seven-year-old heart and mind. Mm -hmm. But I then remember different times, when I was 11, when I was 14, when I was 16, when new things, when my life was made up of different things than, what, than my seven-year-old heart knew about. Sure. And I had to continually reassert God's dominion over that life at that point. And so I have, you know, I do not reject the event of salvation, but I don't think that it is the whole truth. I think that, I think in the same way that process <laughs> salvation is erroneous, the way some people teach it, I think event-driven salvation as a thing in itself is erroneous. I don't think you have one without the other. Mm. Yeah, you don't, you don't stay in that spiritual state that you were at seven years old. You don't stay at that level of understanding and never move beyond salvation uh, and relationship with God at, that you had at seven. Yes, sir? I think repentance is often confused with forgiveness, but repentance for many 
people is just saying I'm sorry. Mm. Kind of right. Is turning away, and you realize that you're out of alignment, mm -hmm. and you see that, and you turn away from it, and you try not to go back to it. But a lot of people just think repentance as well. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. Yeah, a lot of people think it's I just I have remorse or I have regret or oops or uh, yeah I acknowledge that I'm I'm wrong. Yeah, Ronnie. This is one of the reasons why in repentance dealing with religious people is very difficult because externally they don't have a lot of garbage. You know they mm -hmm. well, right. I'm not a murderer. Right. I'm not a rapist. I pay my taxes. But whereas you get some a guy on Skid Row, he's going to say, yeah, man, I messed up. I need help. Mm -hmm. And he's halfway there, mm -hmm. realizing he's got to make a change. Like family members, I have family members that they're moral people. They're ethical people. And they're not safe. Mm -hmm. Even though they have an ethical, moral life. Right because they have no relationship with God. Their only relationship with, is with themselves. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, I'm going to try and speed through this, could have like two extra minutes. I'm not going to finish everything, but I want to at least get to true repentance, okay? So, false repentance finally doesn't last. person really will eventually go, go back to their old ways, one way or another. And they'll find that when temptation comes, they don't have power to overcome temptation when repentance is false. So, true repentance. You have a very deep awareness of a change in your thinking and motive. You are conscious that your mind has changed and is changing. Uh, it's not just a state of your feeling. Uh, I remember when I gave my heart to God for real when I was 18, overnight, um, it's like my mind was a new thing to me. I wasn't just excited. My awareness of myself, it's almost like a new person had been kind of put in me. It's, what I, it's how I, I could identify it as. I, I literally was in the dark before and now I had the light turned on and uh, everything about me was like a new thing in my thinking. Uh, my thought patterns were immediately starting to become changed. Uh, it was a very deep awareness of change and my motive had changed. I wanted to know God more. I knew very little about God, but I wanted to know more and I wanted to be close to God. True repentance, you won't value what you formerly did. You won't spend your time and your energies and all of your, all of your interests and, and the uh, resources and everything. It will change. I'm not telling you how it will change or what that looks like, but you will change. The things you valued will change. Your will, not just your external actions, but your will itself is subdued or fully surrendered to God. True repentance. You'll be unwilling to repeat the, past, uh, the same past sins. In fact, I would venture to say that the sins that held you most strongly are the ones you should hate the most and the ones that you will probably most, uh, most strongly oppose. The sins that held my mind and controlled me the most as a teenager, when I gave my life to God, I had a deep realization that no matter what, I can never go back to that thing that held my mind the most. And I never really have. Um, when you really, really repent from a thing, you hate sin, and you hate the sins that once held you, and you will make efforts to stand against them. Your outward conduct will be different. Things should be different. Does changing things outwardly mean you've repented? No. But if you really repent, there will be, firstly, an inward change. But you will have an outward change as well. I freaked a lot of people out when I gave my life to God. All my old friends didn't know what to do with me, and I didn't really know what to do with them, honestly. Um, I had no wisdom on how to handle that situation, but everything changed. It results in a complete change of character. Sin is now a repugnant, repugnant thing. It is an awful thing. Not just, the, not just the sins, but the idea of disobeying God, to choose opposite what you believe God would want you to do, that's a horrible thought if you've truly repented. It results in a repentance not to be repented of. We covered that. It's not something you want to go back from. True repentance is the heart's disposition to reject sin and obey God to the best of one's knowledge. 
and you may have really little, little teeny tiny knowledge, but when you've truly repented, you're willing to love God with all of that little bit of knowledge as best you can. So those are the ways I would sum up true and false repentance.